Nazanin, thanks so much for talking to us. There's a lot going on in the world at the moment with Israel and Gaza. It has become a focal point. And I think as we look at that conflict, there's so much complexity in it. But as we look at it, we really need to understand Iran's role in it mm -hmm. and its proxies. What do you say about that first up? Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think the reaction of the Iranian or the Islamic Republic authorities when right after Hamas attacked in such a brutal, horrific way, uh, innocent Israeli civilians, that was very telling. That reaction of jubilant celebration that the authorities in Iran um, spread videos of and shared videos of says everything. They, by this action, by Hamas's brutalities, have managed to divert attention away from woman life freedom and the domestic abuse that they're unleashing on their own people. And they've jeopardized uh, the Saudi-Israel normalization process. So yes, they are the number one backer of Hamas and Hezbollah. They fund them, they train them. And I think this was intentional. Yeah. and. What we do see is, uh, I think, a fig leaf. Uh, again, Iran sending its proxies to do its work for now. I don't know what a, a point that escalates. But Israel's stated aim now is to defeat Hamas. But you can't defeat an ideology. Mm. How do you approach that difficult question? I mean, one thing we have to be very mindful of is our is Israel playing into the hands of Hamas? Is this exactly what Hamas wanted? For innocent Palestinian civilians to die and then be able to radicalize even more people and children mm -hmm. and be able to use more human shields and be able to unleash more terror as a result. We have to at some point end this vicious cycle of violence and I think it takes extreme moral courage to be able to do that. And at some point we have to understand that justice and revenge are two separate things. Hamas needs to be ended. That's, there's absolutely no way uh, that that region will be free and, and peaceful with Hamas and Hezbollah's ex existence. But what's the cause of it here? What's the cause of that terror? And from my perspective and the type of work I do, I point fingers to the Islamic Republic authorities as the backer of Hamas and Hezbollah. They are responsible for that terrorism as their proxies. And again, as I said, it's intentional. It, it works in their favor to have this instability. It diverts attention away, away from their own abuses. And as long as the Islamic Republic regime is in power, the Middle East will not be peaceful and there won't be global stability. I think it's hard to understand what their end game is. Do you understand what the, what the end game is? You know, there are three pillars of the Islamic Republic since 1979, since the inception of the, the regime. Um, the oppression of women and the compulsory hijab being the outward symbol of that. Death to Israel, death to America. That was how they were founded. And, you know, that's why the women's rights movement and the woman life freedom revolution is such a powerful force mm -hmm. because imagine if it prevails in crumbling that one pillar of oppressing and segregating Iranian women. And then another one of them is, of course, the, the destruction of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they do that through their proxies and, and they try to gain support for it internationally. There's no doubt in my mind that they're trying to influence and uh, interfere with some of these protests to, to wreak havoc in the West. Um, but we have to be very mindful of not letting that happen. Democracies have a responsibility to band together mm. uh, against autocracies. And so far, unfortunately, for 44 years, the, the only way we've approached the problems of the Iran have been to deal with the symptoms of the problem. So the nuclear issue, terrorism, hostage taking, domestic oppression, regional aggression. We haven't addressed the cause. The cause is the regime itself and the people of Iran are demanding um, fundamental political change, we must support them. Yeah, and they are doing it bravely and to, to great personal risk to themselves and their families because we know from history how these regimes operate. I'm conscious of as we sit here today, and I wonder if this has um, crossed your mind as well, where is the line between, you know, imposing 
our own Western values mm -hmm. on uh, a nation, a group of people that uh, might not want to see that? Is there a, you know, a patriarchal uh, sense of that that we're trying to impose um, and a kind of belittling that, you know, you can't see the best of what, what you can have. I wonder how you approach that. That's an excellent question. You know, for 15 years that I've been doing this work, well-meaning progressives have often said to me, well, we can't touch the compulsory hijab issue because that's a cultural issue and, and you know, cultural differences in the Islamic Republic. For a year now, the brave Iranian women and girls and people have risen up to debunk this myth of cultural differences because essentially no cultural norm needs to be enforced through threat of violence. What they've proven is that this despotic culture is not theirs. It belongs to their Islamist regime. Mm. So now when I talk to a lot of progressive lawmakers, they understand that that was a mistake, that that sort of hands-off approach. And what it is essentially is this overcompensation in response to imperialism, right? Mm. This anti-imperialist approach. But today's liberal Iranian is not the, uh, the, the anti-imperialist of yesteryear, of 79. Yeah. This generation, is so connected to us and, and democracy. Mm. And you know, to say that they are different and they don't want democracy is actually an insult. Yeah. You know? And social media obviously has played a huge part in that. The regime, of all, for all its control, cannot shut that window to the outside world, mm. if I can put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the advent of smartphones with cameras mm. uh, and social media has really just um, increased the, 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 the way that citizen journalists in Iran can share images of, of what they experience, the daily indignities they experience. And so that's why internet shutdowns happen, crackdowns happen. And one of the things I said to the foreign minister when I, when I met with her, uh, with, with uh, Foreign Minister Penny Wong yesterday, was um, you know, the, the person, the, the, the communications minister in Iran, the Islamic Republic's communication minister, is someone who got their PhD from the University of New South Wales. His two kids were born in Australia. He then went back to Iran in 2016, became the communications minister, and is responsible for the internet shutdowns in Iran, and we haven't sanctioned him yet. And, and that crackdown on the internet allowed the regime to kill in the dark. The EU and the US have sanctioned him, Australia hasn't. So I pleaded with the foreign minister to please sanction him um, and people like him who are responsible for abuses. And was Penny Wong receptive to Abs your plea? Absolutely, she was very receptive. I look forward to that being implemented. Um, but those are the types of actions we need to take, I think, in free societies to, to hold them to, to, to account. Well, you're in Sydney to receive the Sydney Peace Prize and congratulations for that. Um, it is a, a, a right and a correct acknowledgement of your work. I think sometimes Australians can have um, a small view of themselves uh, and look at what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Iran and think that's a faraway place, it's not something I'm directly involved in or should get involved with. But what do you think in a more connected world with globalisation is the role of a country like Australia? That's an excellent question. You know, for the past year, I've really been advocating for unity. The way the Islamic Republic has stayed in power, and a lot of autocracies and dictatorships stay in power, is by dividing and ruling. Mm. And that doesn't only include their own people. They're not just dividing and ruling their own people, because they understand that the people united will never be defeated. Mm. But it's also dividing the international community. Um, and so as long as we are divided, free, freedom-loving, democratic countries are divided in how we approach Iran and how we, how we approach the Islamic Republic, I should say, and um, the autocracies are united in their common objectives, this world has no chance. Um, there will be no stability and, and global peace. Right now we see the Islamic Republic sending drones to Russia to use against Ukraine. In exchange they get surveillance technology from, from Russia to use against um, protesters and women, women protesting against compulsory hijab. And same with China, feeds um, the, the Islamic Republic with, with surveillance technology. So they're very much united in their common objectives and we're just not. We need multinational approach to, towards the Islamic Republic in order to be able to, to tip the balance of power in favour of the brave protesters and hopefully seeing, um, to see secular democracy prevail. I mean, it's such a um, convoluted web 
um, which would be you know too difficult to explain right now but essentially it comes down to countries like Iran the Islamic Republic its backers and that web that we talk about they're winning the information war in many ways and you see Western democracies like Australia um, and their citizens they're pitted against each other absolutely within yes and that threat of dividing people here parties you know it, it's 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 not only essential that we have a multinational approach but a bipartisan cross-party approach mm. towards um, autocrats and despots yeah. and tyranny and until that happens we really we have no way of, of succeeding but imagine imagine a free secular democratic Iran if the woman life freedom revolution prevails it will not only create obviously uh, an incredibly powerful and free democratic country but it will uh, basically support peace in the region and global stability. I think it benefits every Australian, every person in any free society to fight for the rights of the Iranian people. Dazanin, can you see that happening in our lifetime? We're a similar age. Yes. Um, can you see that happening, you know, for the generation after us? I can, and the only reason is because I see the tenacity and the resilience of these young Iranians who keep going. Um, hundreds of thousands of Iranian women are currently still flouting compulsory hijab on the streets of major cities in Iran, mm. despite these brutal crackdowns. And with that type of courage, they can only succeed.